Good evening. I am Senator Dr. Romel Springer. This occasion marks the third annual Ermi Bourne Memorial Lecture, a celebration of the life, work, and contribution of the first female parliamentarian elected to the House of Assembly in Barbados, and one of St. Andrew's most beloved and much appreciated daughters, Dane Edna Ermin Trueborn. This year's lecture will be delivered by Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, himself a product of the bucolic parish of St. Andrew. Sir Hilary received his higher education in the United Kingdom, graduating from the University of Hull with a BA in Economic and Social History in 1976, followed by a PhD in 1980. He has had a distinguished career as an academic, international thought leader, and United Nations Committee official, and global public activist in the field of social justice and minority employment. He has lectured internationally and has published over 100 peer review essays and has offered 12 books on subjects ranging from Atlantic and Caribbean history, gender relations in the Caribbean, sport development, and popular culture. He served as a member of the United Nations Task Force on Science and Sustainable Development and was also invited to serve as editor of the ninth volume of the UNESCO General History of Africa. Sir Hillary delivered the feature address at the 2017 sitting of the UN General Assembly to declare the decade for African descendant people. Sir Hillary was also invited to coordinate Caribbean government's policy position on the global reparatory justice conversation. In this capacity, he was asked to chair the newly established Caribbean Commission on Reparations. Under his guidance, the University of West Indies has established the Caribbean Center for Reparation Research. He served as an associate member of the London University Legacy of Slavery Project and the University of Hull's Wilberforce Institute for Slavery and Emancipation. He is also a member of the United Nations Development Program Advisory Panel for the Caribbean Human Development Report. Ladies and gentlemen, it is with sincere pleasure that I invite Professor Sir Hilary Beckles, Vice Chancellor of the University of West Indies, to deliver the 2020 Ermi Bourne Memorial Lecture. Our distinguished and honorable Prime Minister, Mayor Motley, members of the Bourne family, the Honorable George Payne, representative for the Paris of St. Andrew in the Barbados Parliament and patron of the Ermi Bourne Foundation. Senator Dr. Rommel Springer, other distinguished members of Parliament, officials of the Ermi Bourne Foundation and other dignitaries, the St. Andrew uh, community and all friends and participants. It gives me tremendous honor to be able to deliver this Ermi Bourne Memorial Lecture. As a child growing up in the parish of St. Andrew, her name and reputation were legendary. We knew of her, we celebrated her tremendous historical intervention as the first woman to enter into the Barbados Parliament following adult suffrage uh, in 1950-51. Speaking in respect of her legacy, therefore, is not only an honor as an inhabitant of the St. Andrew Parish, but also as a historian who fully understands her enormous contribution to the development of black lives globally and, of course, nationally. The title of this presentation focuses on why Barbados has a responsibility, duty, and honor to lead in the world at this moment in time within the context of the global Black Lives Matter movement. I will say a great deal about that later on because 
I wish to speak about the specific history of Barbados within the context of what has become the challenge facing this, this movement. It is interesting indeed, very interesting indeed, that the first image we have in our historical record of Barbados, which depicts the island in 1657 and the first map which we have available to us that was published with Richard Ligon's book, A True and Exact History of the Island of Barbados. On that map, there is an image of a runaway African out in rebellion in the parish of St. Andrew. And so Barbados therefore begins its iconic history, its history of images, within the context of the first African out in rebellion in the parish of St. Andrew. And this is significant, I suspect, given that I am speaking about Ermy Bourne's representation and eruption in the parish of St. Andrew and the connectivity of these realities, I think, are quite, are quite significant. It is symbolic in the sense, therefore, of speaking about Ermy Bourne as a rebellious figure erupting into our parliament as, as the, first, the first woman to do so. But there is a greater significance of this in terms of the gender history of Barbados. Barbados has a unique demographic history. It became the first British colony in the New World and the Americas where women have outnumbered men, not only in respect of the African population, but also the English population. So Barbados has been a female majority society from the early 18th century all the way through to the present time. So from about 1712, 1715, women have outnumbered men in Barbados, which makes Barbados a female dominant society, a unique experience in the context of the last 300 years. This is also significant in terms of not only uh, the political entry into the Parliament of Barbados of Ermey Bourne in 1951, but it is also significant in the context of the Honourable Prime Minister, Mayor Motley, becoming the first Prime Minister of Barbados. And one might ask the question, why did it take so long, given this 300 years of female majority in Barbados. So Barbados has this unique history in that regard, but there are many other areas that I wish to, I wish to address at this time. In terms of the challenges facing the African and the black communities globally at this time, and the uh, and the, the, the struggle to advance human rights and civil rights and to complete the process of emancipation and the, the search for dignity. In all of that context, Barbados has a very specific role to play. The issue of the dignity of the black community against the backdrop of a history of slavery and colonization. Barbados is unique in terms of the constitutional steps along this journey. It was as early as 1636, just a decade after the colonization of Barbados, that Barbados became the first colony 
in the Caribbean, if not indeed in the Americas, in which the parliament made a determination that all Africans arriving on the shores of this colony from here on in must be used and recognized as the property of their owners forever. Unless there was specific contractual circumstances to the country. So 1636, Barbados leaves the way in the Caribbean, in the Americas, and defining African peoples as the property of other persons for life. In other words, not for three or four or five years, but for the remainder of their lives. This becomes the critical legal contribution to the rise of international big business and commercial capitalism. Because now that the labor input is recognized as property, investors are now placed in a very strong position to make significant capital investments in slavery, to import thousands and millions of Africans because they now believe that their investment is safe, secured by legislation. This is now the parliamentary position and therefore slavery is placed on a firm business foundation. Barbados then, on the basis of that provision, began its journey to become the first black majority society in all of the Americas. That is absolutely unique. Again, Barbados becomes the incubator. Barbados becomes the home of what we call the slave economy. And we make a distinction between societies and economies with enslaved Africans as opposed to economies and societies that are dependent and built entirely upon enslaved Africans. So that all of the societies in the Americas in the 1650s are using enslaved Africans mixed in with other forms of labor, white indentured labor, indigenous enslaved labor, but Barbados becomes the first society and the first economy that was entirely dependent upon the use of enslaved African labor and Africans became the majority. So Barbados has this unique feature of being the oldest, the oldest black society in our hemisphere. And from the point of view of the Black Lives Matters movement, Barbados becomes the pioneer of this concept of utilizing African labor as the basis of economic development transformation. Barbados therefore becomes the first society in our hemisphere where black people became the majority. This in itself made Barbados one of the most famous and recognized societies in the world in the 17th century because it was understood that slavery was going to be the business model and Barbados was the place that had laid the legal and financial infrastructure to allow this slavery model to emerge. This development, the concept that a financial model can be 
structured in such a way on the assumption that you can bring thousands of African peoples across an ocean. You could enslave them in agriculture and in business and commerce, and you could make a substantial return from your investment. That was the business model that Barbados pioneered and became famous for. To the extent that Barbados also had, at the same time in the middle of the 17th century, just 50 years after colonization, Barbados had the largest white population in any British colony. So if you take Virginia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Philadelphia, all the way down, all the British colonies, Barbados had the largest white population as well as the largest black population. It therefore became the center of this new enterprise called the economy of, of slavery. Barbados, as early as 1665, was home to some 30,000 enslaved Africans. Barbados became the society where it was understood that if you wanted to, un you wanted to participate in the economics of slavery, that was the place to visit. That was the place to go and learn. That was the place to go and observe how it is done. I'm setting the stage for the conception of this small island in the Eastern Caribbean as the richest economic system in the entire Americas. And this is how Barbados was described as a result of the slavery system. The richest spot of land in the world was how Barbados was described in the middle of the 17th century. It meant that Bridgetown became one of the busiest ports in the Americas. It meant that Barbados became the center and Bridgetown the center of the international slave trade enterprise. Barbados is now the home of global slavery. Bridgetown is now the most significant and dynamic slave trading port in the Americas. This is important, so let us speak a little now about the origins of Barbados as the home of slave trading and plantation slavery. We have evidence to show that the first slave ship that arrived in the Caribbean, if not in the Americas, arrived in Barbados in 1641. African slaves found themselves in many colonies across the Americas through internal distribution. But the arrival of a slave ship directly from Africa, landing in the Caribbean, the first records we have of such a direct shipment was 1641 when a slave ship carrying the name of the Star, a London-based slave ship that had traveled to Ghana and had departed Accra with 299 Africans from what was then called the Gold Coast, contemporary Ghana departed directly for Barbados. There was a 20% loss of life in the Middle Passage. The result being that 239 of those Ghanaians arrived at Bridgetown Barbados. 
This was the first slave ship directly from Africa arriving in the Caribbean, arriving in a British, a British colony. Over the next 150 years, there were over 251 voyages, 251 voyages from the Gold Coast, Ghana, to Barbados. 52,000 Gold Coast Africans departed for Barbados and 44,000 of them arrive at Barbados, a mortality loss of about 14% in the Middle Passage. We know from studying these documents that the vast majority of these 44,000 Gold Coast Africans, their ships departed from Accra, Alampo, Anombu, the Cape Coast, Elmina, Keta, and many other unspecified places. The result of this large number of Africans in Barbados meant that Barbados again had to show the world and pioneer the issue of passing legislation to frame within a colonial constitution what slavery ought to be. And Barbados stepped out again and became the first colony in the English Americas that laid down what we now call the slave laws. The Barbados Act of 1661, an act for the better ordering and governing of Negroes passed by the Barbados Parliament, in which the Africans in that legislation are described as heathens and brutes, not suited to be governed by the same laws as persons from the British community. This law specified exactly how Africans ought to be treated as property, as non-humans, as chattel, and as real estate. So Barbados laid the foundation for the English empire. These laws migrated from Barbados across the other British colonies and were adopted and adapted uh, as their colonial laws. The Barbados Act of 1661 was amended in 1776. In 1676, 1682, and 1688. The 1688 amendment is especially important in this context because that was the amendment in which Africans were now classified not simply as property, but given the status as real estate. So the owner of an enslaved African was in possession of real estate. And this is the foundation laid down in Barbados that became the model for the rest of the British Empire. And that included the North American colonies as well as other Caribbean colonies. What then was black life? Barbados became the pioneer in the definition of what black life constituted that black life was not human life, that black life was property, chattel, 
and real estate. Barbados then laid clearly the foundation for a perception that became the global norm that Africans were non-human, that their lives could only be measured in terms of the market economy. Barbados in its slave laws said that all of the characteristics of property applied to black life. That blacks could be bought and sold, could be leased, could be mortgaged, could be used as cash, could be bequeathed, and all other forms of transfer of property, black life could be utilized in these fashions. And this was the contribution that Barbados made to the rise of the slave system throughout the world. Barbados became the incubator for this conception of how black lives ought to be treated on the law, not on the custom, but within the context of parliamentary provision. And so when the Barbados slave owners receive the authority and the support from the British government in 1654 to conquer and colonize Jamaica, to take Jamaica away from the Spanish and transfer the Barbados slave plantation system to Jamaica. When former governor Modiford of Barbados became the governor of Jamaica, when that invasion was successful and the Barbados slave owners took possession of Jamaica, they carried the 1661 law, the slave laws to Jamaica. And that became the basis of the slave society and the economy in Jamaica. Indeed, when Thomas Modiford became the governor, governor of Jamaica, after his long stint in Barbados, he took great pride in laying the Barbados laws before the Jamaican assembly. But that was a whole. The Barbadian slave owners, both now in Barbados and in Jamaica, received the patent from the British Crown to colonize what is now called South Carolina. And they took the Barbados Slave Act to South Carolina. And this was the project of John and Peter Colleton, well-known Barbadian slavers, who were involved in the financing of the colonization of South Carolina. They took the Barbados legislation and used it as the basis for creating a slave society in South Carolina. And the consequence being that South Carolina in turn followed Barbados and South Carolina became the first American colony in which Africans were a majority. So what the Barbadians did in the Caribbean, they also reproduced in the mainland in South Carolina. And therefore you can see how Barbados slave owners are driving this toxic slavery culture, this brutal social structure, this extremely demeaning and degrading economic system. The Barbadian slave owners have now sent this across the Caribbean and pushed it north into the American mainland. And this is why Barbados is recognized as the incubator, as the great spreader, the distributor of this model of chattel slavery 
in which African peoples are classified as non-humans. But inevitably, the Africans will rebel. And the Ghanaians, who were described as the largest number of Africans from any one place, the Akan people, who were the majority group in Barbados, they were able to plan this massive rebellion in 1675 in Barbados that was betrayed and Africans paid the price. But the importance of that is that the Africans in Barbados in 1675 had imagined a new form of governance and Kofi, who was the leader of that rebellion, who was described as an old Gold Coast African, he was to be installed in Barbados as the king of the island. And according to the records, that process of installment was going to be carried out in the classical Ashanti fashion of installment. And King Kofi was going to be the alternate form of government within the slavery system. The consequences were horrendous. 17 of those leaders were burnt alive. Some of them were beheaded and also burnt thereafter. So the putting to death of Africans through the use of fire became also a hemispheric norm that began in Barbados. Spikes down where this rebellion, the St. Peter Parish, the northern part of the island where this rebellion was planned. The square, the city, the center of Spikestown became the place where the bonfire was lit and these Africans were burnt alive. Cuffey included was burnt alive in Spikestown as a public spectacle, as an example to the others what would happen if they resisted their owners. So Barbados also gave the common system of punishment, the notion that people could be beheaded, burnt, or burnt alive in a public square. This is what happened in Spikestown in 1675. We can go further and show how Barbados, including its intellectuals, were among the first in the hemisphere to describe what is white supremacy. The clearest articulation of the white supremacy system was written by a Barbadian scholar in 1808. John Poyer, also a St. Peter man, but known as a local historian, gave us through his pen the clearest description of white supremacy that was to become the hemispheric norm. And this is what John Poyer of Barbados wrote in 1808. In every well-constituted society, a state of subordination arises from the nature of civil society. To maintain this fundamental principle, it becomes necessary to preserve the distinctions. First, between the white and the coloreds. Second, between the coloreds and the blacks. Nature, he says, nature has strongly defined the differences, not only in the complexion but in the mental and intellectual faculties. 
our laws, our Barbados laws, have merely acknowledged and adopted the distinction. In other words, white people were naturally superior to colored people who were naturally superior to black people. Black people is in, are inferior to colored people and white people. And that was nature that had made that distinction. Barbados was merely legislating what nature had already provided. So again, Barbados gives to the Americas the clearest articulation of the concept of white supremacy. Not surprisingly, therefore, Barbados also gives the hemisphere one of the first books written about the breeding of slaves as animals. How it is possible to disconnect from the slave trade and breed your own slaves on the plantations. And what we had in Barbados published in 1786 was a book entitled The Following Instructions Are Offered to the consideration of managers of plantations. It is written by 10 of the leading slave owners of Barbados. But the two leading authors were the Duke of Hereward, Edwin Lasalles, and the Reverend John Brathwaite. And the thesis of the book is that you can only successfully breed slaves if you treat them well. And therefore, the thesis written in bold in the book says the following. The increase is the only test of the care with which they are treated. In other words, in this book, a model of how to breed slaves was articulated, a prenatal policy, a postnatal policy. Give the slave women, the enslaved women, an incentive to have babies. For the first child, you give them so many shillings. For the second child, so many shillings. And you have a gradation of financial incentives given to enslaved women to bring babies into the world. The same incentives were offered to the midwives to make sure that they survive. And then they were given incentives for postnatal care. After the child, they were taken out of the field. They were given extra nutrition and so on. So the Barbadian slave owners pioneered the concept of incentivizing enslaved African women to bring more property into the world in order to capitalize their estates. This was, again, one of the economic intellectual contributions of the Barbados enslavers. Barbados is, again, demonstrating the mastery of the economics and the financing of enslaved peoples. Then, of course, we have Nelson, who goes up there in 1813 as the person whose responsibility using British naval and military power is to protect this massive economic infrastructure. This is his role to make sure that it continues to yield more and more profits through slave breeding and through the economics of exploitation. But dialectically comes the Buster Rebellion. So as the slave owners erected Nelson, the enslaved began their mobilization to destroy Nelson and all that he stood for, which is the slave economy. So between 1813, when Nelson is erected, and 1816, just three years, the Black Barbadians had mobilized this island-wide rebellion to destroy Nelson and to destroy slavery. But the importance of this rebellion from the point of view of Black Lives Matter is that the Barbadian enslaved were the first of the enslaved in the Caribbean 
who moved to validate what the Haitians had done through Toussaint Louverture and John Jack Desley. In other words, the Haitians had established the fact just 10 to 15 years earlier that it is possible to defeat slave owners, bring freedom, bring citizenship. And the Barbadian enslaved Africans were the first to take the example of that and try their best to implement it. It becomes the first major rebellion in the Americas that followed directly from the Haitian model. And this is why, again, Barbados has this role to play in the Black Lives Matter movement, because it was on this island of Barbados that the enslaved took it upon themselves to support, demonstrate, legitimize, and validate what the Haitians had done. They were next in line. And the documents of that rebellion, the War of General Busser, the documents specify very clearly that the enslaved of Barbados had said that they must do what the Haitians have done, and the only way to get their freedom was to follow the lead of Toussaint Louverture, Jean Jacques Gesson. This is a very important contribution. So, in 1816, the enslaved Barbadians are saying this yes. We are in the foreground of the Black Lives Matter movement, and we're going, to, we're going to remove slavery from this island in much the same way that it was done successfully in Haiti. This puts the Barbadian population in a very important historic position. So Barbados then now confronts the emancipation legislation. The British Parliament has now realized that they cannot hold on to slavery anymore. The black people in the Caribbean are too rebellious because after Barbados, Guyana goes up in rebellion in 1823, then Jamaica goes up in rebellion in 1831, and the only way they could maintain slavery is by massive military oppression, but that they knew would not work either. So they go to Parliament to legislate. But who are the main Caribbean objectors and resistors to emancipation? The Barbados slave owners. The Barbados slave owners said, slavery is our brand. We have created this model and we are not going to sit back and allow the British government to destroy what we have created. We are the creators of the economy of slavery. We have shown the world how the economy of slavery worked. We have exported our slave system to other countries, other colonies. We are the global owners of slavery. We were the ones who over 200 years perfected it, exported it, and demonstrated how it works. And we're not going to accept the fact that you, the British Parliament, that has supported us all along, you are now changing your position to undermine what we had created together. And so the Barbadian organized, the Barbadian enslavers organized. They appointed John Pollard Mears in London. They gave him an office, and his job was to fight every step that the British Parliament made to resist and object to every development in Parliament, every clause in the draft of emancipation legislation. And Mr. Mears became a legend in Britain. It be he became the one who was fighting against the mighty Buxton. Buxton was drafting the legislation, conceptualizing emancipation. Politics in London became Mears versus Buxton, Barbados. Little England versus Great Britain. That is how it was described. That Little England, Barbados, was standing up to mighty Great Britain and defending slavery and ensuring that legislation did not pass. But the Barbados slave owners did not only participate in that intellectual conversations to defend slavery, which they were so proud of. 
Barbadian slave owners were the first slave owners in the Caribbean, if not the only slave owners in the Caribbean, who burnt churches, who burnt a church in order to protect slaves. We must not forget the 1823 burning of Sarah Ann Gill's Methodist Chapel, a chapel that was speaking about freedom and justice and anti-slavery. And a community of respected white Barbadians burnt the church to the ground. So in the US colonies, where church burning had become the norm in the 19th century, the Barbadians, the white Barbadians, were among the pioneers of the concept of burning churches in order to defend slavery. There's no evidence of this taking place in other Caribbean societies. Barbadians, who were the owners of slavery and the brand, were prepared to burn a church to defend their brand. Not surprisingly also, Barbados becomes the last of the developed colonies, the last of the developed colonies to ratify emancipation. The British Parliament passed the act. The British Parliament told the colonies, ratify this in your local assemblies and your parliaments. Jamaica went ahead, Trinidad, Demerara, St. Kitts, all of them went ahead. Barbados made it very clear, we are not going to be the architects to destroy that which we have created and we are proud of. The British government had to threaten the Barbados Parliament that if they did not legislate emancipation, they were going to withhold the financial compensation. It was the threat of withholding the financial reparations for slavery that gave the Barbados assemblymen the common sense to pass emancipation legislation. And it was a tremendous amount of money because there were 82,000 enslaved Africans in Barbados. Each of them, of the slave owners, would receive compensation. And in the end, they received 3 million, 3 million, 891,000 pounds. It was a tremendous amount of money. It was a tremendous amount of money. This was their share of the 20 million in cash that the British Parliament had made available to the slaveholders. So Barbados then, by virtue of its resistance, sets the tone for why black life did not matter in the years after emancipation. Barbados became known as a brutal and inhumane society. That was the reputation, fighting emancipation to the very end. How therefore do we, do we sustain the thesis that Barbados should provide the leadership? This is the history that all Barbadians should rise up, participate, know and become advocates that Barbados was the home of the structured white supremacy model. Barbados was the place where the white supremacy notion that black life did not matter, that people are animals, property, chattel, and real estate. Barbados was the place where this was perfected and exported. Barbados built the brand and showed the world how it should work. It is for these reasons that Barbadians have a duty. Given the role that they have played, Barbados has a duty to the rest of the world to turn this history upon its head. That Barbados should become the freest society in the world. That every Barbadian should commit to our island becoming the freest island in the world because it was indeed the place where slavery had consolidated itself. For 300 years, Barbados was the center 
of racial hatred, racial oppression, racial brutalization of African people. This is what Barbados was known for. We have a duty now to turn this head around, that Barbados should now, in its contribution to the Black Lives Matter movement, commit itself to being the leading society in the world that celebrates freedom for everyone, where every black person in the world would know that Barbados stands with them in democracy and justice and equality and in freedom. We owe it to the world, we Barbadians, we owe it to the world to turn this history around, to become the center of freedom, of justice, of equality. This is why Barbados, because of its history, has a duty and a responsibility to lead. And the fact that after 300 years of having a female majority in our island, and we celebrate Ermi Bourne for being the first of them to enter the parliament, and we celebrate the Honorable Mayor Motley as our first female Prime Minister, pushing aside the traditions of masculine authority and hegemony, that these developments are important. And along that journey to equality, we can boast finally a female head of state in our elected parliament. Of course, we already have our head of state in the context of our governor generals, and we have had two very brilliant and distinguished women who performed that service. But elected by the masses of people to be the executive leaders of this island, this is a step along the journey. And my final comment, therefore, in celebration of the life and times of Ernie Bourne, is how wonderful it would be, how wonderful it would be if the world, when it thinks of Barbados, think not of its historical participation as the founder of the slavery model, but it now becomes the founder of the justice model, the freedom model, that when you hear the word Barbados, you think of freedom, justice, equality, and that will be the new defining identity of the island and nation state. How wonderful that would be. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a very riveting and thought-provoking presentation. At this time, I would like to invite the Honorable Mia Amor Motley, Prime Minister of Barbados, to give closing remarks. Good evening, everyone. I'd really like to thank you for joining us on this wet evening as we listen to our distinguished Barbadian Vice Chancellor, Sir Hilary Beckles, on this most meaningful and relevant topic to us, BLM, Black Lives Matter, Why Barbados Must Lead. And I think that you would have appreciated that this is not a journey that he started recently, but we have been on this journey for some time. I take particular comfort that just under 20 years ago, I asked Sir Hilary to take my place um, in the leadership of the Barbados delegation when we went to Durban, South Africa, trying to urge the world that these things mattered and that these subjects needed addressing because we needed to be able to bring redress to our people and to our country after centuries of exploitation. It is appropriate that this lecture is being given in tribute to Ermi Bourne, our first female parliamentarian, and that she should have come from the wonderful parish of St. Andrew is something of which all people who come from and are associated with this parish are happy for. We, at this time, are celebrating, therefore, the breaking of new ground with her, in the same way that Sir Hilary's lecture speaks to us of the continued need for breaking of new ground in order to bring greater development to our people as we go forward. And I say so, conscious, that even as we reflect on this evening's proceedings, we also must reflect on the needs of the people of St. Andrew. I want to thank the Member of Parliament, the Honourable George Payne, for his continued strong representation of his people. I want to thank Senator, the Honourable Romel Springer, for his work in organising this lecture and indeed for his comments at the beginning of this lecture. He gave the inaugural lecture two years ago, Senator Cummins did last year, and now Sir Hillary this year. 
But in all these things, it causes me to reflect and to wonder on where and how we make it better for the people of St. Andrew as we go forward. This week, the Parliament addressed the issue, as I had promised you we would, with respect to the acquisition of Ermie Bourne's property, because it is our view that that must become an important memorial, museum, and landmark so that Barbadians and others visiting this country can visit and learn about her and learn about the country in which she functioned when she became the first female parliamentarian to step up the parliament steps. Similarly, we have had the honor of renaming the committee room in parliament after Dame Ermintrude Bourne. Today, in addition to the acquisition of that property and the renaming of that committee room, I also want to speak to you about the needs of St. Andrew people today as we speak. Our government is committed to ensuring that the people of White Hill will receive the stability in their lives that they have so long wanted. Indeed, the Solicitor General is now signing off on the last contractual arrangements to be signed with the Chinese government who will undertake the works to do all of our roads along the East Coast which are badly in need of repair and then about 30 main community roads within the East Coast of which White Hill is the most prominent. I look forward to therefore those roads starting within the near future once we complete the contractual arrangements with the Chinese government. Similarly, I also look forward to our being able to ensure that we can get behind us the difficulties of access to water on the East Coast. And as you are well aware, that work will start shortly with the additional pump that is to go at Vineyard, the construction of the reservoir, as I've said before, up to Stuart Hill, and the pumping of additional water that will allow us to be able to ensure that water from St. John to St. Andrew to St. Joseph to St. Lucy to St. Peter, that we are in a position to be able to have regular water supply as we go forward in spite of the climate crisis that is now with us. But in all of these things, we are working towards improving the quality of life for you, the people of St. Andrew. And we hope that in working together, we can make that a considerably improved experience. These are unusual times. The mere fact that we are having this um, lecture virtually speaks to the reality that we now live in with respect to COVID. But I say to you that in spite of that anxiety, in spite of your concerns, I ask us to stay focused, to stay stable, and to recognize too that this too shall pass. But when it passes, the question is what kind of parish and what kind of Barbados we want. As we look forward to working with you, because there are still a number of things that we need to do in order to redress the imbalances that have occurred as a result of our past. And I believe that we are in a position, as I said, to do so with all of you and with your Member of Parliament and with all who want to come to representation. I look forward to the day when I will be able to ensure that you can take pride in the legacy of Ermi Bourne. And I want to thank the representative for being the driving force behind this lecture series. His representation of this parish has been strong, it has been effective, and I believe that I would love the opportunity to be able to ensure that I can address him as something else other than just simply George. And I think you and I both know what I mean. But those days are ahead of us. My friends, I look forward equally to our being able to discuss with the people of St. Andrew. We had hoped to do so during the gathering, and I hope that you will still have your ideas for them so that we can hear from you directly how you believe this parish can develop, how this parish can mature. At the same time, we also recognize that within the context of Ermi Bourne's legacy, it cannot simply be about being the first woman to have served in Parliament. I've said many times that being the first is not the achievement to celebrate, but it is the extent to which those who are first can open the doors for those who must come behind them to ensure that many shall come and many shall be called. Against that backdrop, I wonder how best we can pay tribute to her legacy. And in so doing, I ask myself, how do we create a grassroots women's movement that is dedicated towards strengthening parenting and strengthening the development of our families in this country so as to ensure that our children can become the best that they can be? 
It's a funny thing to say because people assume that once you're talking about politics, you're not going to talk about the household. But in our society, the two are inextricably linked. And the example of Ermi Bourne going where no woman had gone before is an example that gives us courage and that gives us the ability to recognize that we now need to claim ground where we have not claimed it before. And where is that? In strengthening the ability of all of our women to be able to become the best that they can be by giving them as many options across the society, in their communities and in their families. It means strengthening the framework for parental education. It means strengthening the support that is given to them. It means recognizing unpaid labor that is used to care people in our families and in our communities. And it also means, in some instances, finding new ways of decentralizing how we care for each other. If we do these things, then I truly do believe that we will add and give expression to that which Ermi Bourne fought for back in the 1950s when she came forward to be able to represent you, the people of this parish. Similarly, if we give expression to this, then it will allow us to lay the platform to create what I've always said, that nurturing environment for Barbadians to become global citizens, but retaining their values and their roots as Barbadians. I look forward to working with you, to making all of this happen. And I trust and pray that the lecture that was delivered this evening shall become compulsory reading, not just for the people of St. Andrew, but for the people of this nation. When we set a vision and a mission, then it is for us to be able to get as many people on board as we can. Because as I've always said, many hands make light work, and it is in many hands making light work that Barbados will continue to punch above its weight, not just in the Caribbean, not just in the Americas, but globally, because this is our world, and we know it's in trouble. We know it needs the help of each and every one. And as Mahatma Gandhi said, the change begins with each of us. Thank you, and God bless.